Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Mamagonian. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, uh, Nasser. And I welcome you to today's discussion, the blockade of the Lachin Co Corridor and the conquest of Nagorno-Karabakh with an outstanding panel. Um, this program is being presented today by the Nasser Kalust Gulbenkian Foundation Lecture Series on Contemporary Armenian Issues in partnership with the International Institute for Genocide and Human Rights, which is a division of the Zorian Institute and the journal Genocide Studies International. Uh, we thank the Gulbenkian Foundation for their continued support uh, of our contemporary programming, and we especially thank our colleagues at the Zorian Institute as well for partnering with us today. In the now just over one month uh, since the, for now, final Azerbaijani assault on, on Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, on September 19th, and the subsequent emptying of the region of its Armenian population and the arrest of many of its leaders, we have witnessed the movement of international interest in the crisis go from zero to a brief flurry of notice and back quickly to zero again. The reasons for this are more than I wish to get into right now, uh, though they may come up later during our discussions. Nevertheless, important work is being done and has been done by scholars and activists. And the appearance in the late summer of this year of the issue of Genocide Studies International on Nagorno-Karabakh and the Lachin Corridor Crisis was of special significance, and it's the reason for our program today. We're very glad to have the opportunity to call attention to this very valuable work. And uh, I will presently put a link uh, in the uh, Zoom chat uh, to allow attendees to purchase copies of the issue, uh, or if you don't get it uh, and you're seeing this later on YouTube, you can email Nasser or the Zorian Institute for that information. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce and welcome my colleague Megan Reed of the Zorian Institute to give some background on this important publication, which again forms the basis for today's discussion. Megan. Thank you so much, Mark, for this introduction, and thank you to our speakers and our audience for joining us today. Um, as Mark mentioned, today's panel is based on the Zorian Institute's latest 2023 special issue of Genocide Studies International titled Nagorno-Karabakh and the Lachin Corridor Crisis. This special issue was prepared by uh, the journal's editors, Dr. Alex Alvarez, Dr. Adam Muller, Dr. Jennifer Rich, and Dr. Henry Theriot, who is joining us today, to provide a timely analysis that addressed the urgency of removing the blockade of the Lachin Corridor. Typically, a peer-reviewed academic journal can take anywhere from nine months to a year to publish. And this process involves communication with authors, reviewing submissions, copy editing, formatting, printing, and publishing. Uh, and the editors of GSI and the University of Toronto Press were able to put this special issue together from start to finish in just under four months. This was done with the intent of raising awareness of the crisis to the scholarly community, to offer, to offer journalists, specialists, and opinion makers a comprehensive resource on the potential risks of the blockade, and to provide crucial analysis to policymakers to prevent a potential genocide and hold the Republic of Azerbaijan accountable for their violations of international law. As Mark mentioned, since the release of this special issue in August 2023, a military operation by Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh in September led to over 120,000 people being forcefully displaced from the enclave um, through the one entry to Armenia, the Lachin Corridor. This led to the dissolution of, of Nagorno-Karabakh, which has been the indigenous territory of Armenians for over three millenniums. While much has happened uh, since the special issues release, the papers presented in this issue by leading scholars, journalists, and international lawyers, some of whom you will be hearing from today, remain timeless. The issue is an imperative academic resource for understanding and contextualizing the events of today and preparing for the future. I would like to thank Nasser for co-hosting this virtual panel with the Zorian Institute in Zorian Institute today, um, which allows us to combine our constituencies and give the special issue of the journal and its contributing authors a larger platform and audience to share this important work. I would also like to give a special thank you to our editors who whose tireless efforts allowed us to publish this important scholarship for the international community in such a short period of time. 
With over 18 years of publication, Genocide Studies International continues to provide scholarship that has not only shaped the field, but addresses contemporary events like this crisis to provide quality academic resources that can be used for informing policy and hopefully for preventing violence and atrocities of the future. The Institute's work on this subject isn't over, and we are actively looking for ways to con conduct new comparative research on the possible return of Armenians to Nagorno-Karabakh under the international law. This research will explore how the international community can help Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh be repatriated to their ancestral homeland, as was done in the case of Kosovo. The special issue, as Mark mentioned, um, is available for purchase through the Zorn Institute's website. So thank you very much for sharing that link. Um, you are also welcome to contact Nasser or the Zorian Institute if you want more information about how to purchase a copy. Um, and we do encourage you to purchase a copy for yourself and maybe a friend or colleague that isn't really aware of this topic or this issue so that we can continue to raise awareness on this crisis and also help the Zorian Institute fund future research on this very important subject. Thank you and I'm looking forward to everyone's talk today. Great, thank you, Megan. Um, before introducing our panelists, let me mention that following their talks, we will open the floor for audience uh, questions. Um, let me note for audience members uh, watching on Zoom that you may use the Zoom Q&A. In fact, you must use the Zoom Q&A to post your questions. Uh, and uh, we would ask you to please keep them focused on issues related to the presentations today as much as possible. Uh, let me now offer the very briefest of introductions of our panelists in the interest of maximizing our time for their talks and for discussion. Jeffrey Robertson KC is a founding head of Doughty Street Chambers in London. He has had a distinguished career as a trial and appellate counsel, an international judge, and author of leading textbooks, as well as the volume An Inconvenient Genocide, Who Now Remembers the Armenians. Ani Garabed Ohanyan is doctoral candidate at the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University in Worcester, Mass. She is currently working on her dissertation, which focuses on the Armenian genocide's role in Bolshevik Kemalist relations. Henry Terrio is currently Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs at Worcester State University and, uh, and has taught, uh, taught for many years in the philosophy department of the university. He served as president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars from 2017 to 2021 and is founding co-editor of the journal Genocide Studies International. And Bedros Dermatosian is Professor of Modern Middle East History and the Hyman Rosenberg Professor in Judaic Studies at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. He is the author of The Horrors of Adama, Revolution and Violence in the Early 20th Century, and Shattered Dreams of Revolution from Liberty to Violence in the Late Ottoman Empire. And he will be joining the panel uh, in a little while uh, in time for joining the discussion. So now let us uh, turn the microphone over to Jeffrey Robertson, sir. Yeah, well, there's nothing out of this little country in the clouds uh, is or involves the destruction of the rights of its people, its unique culture and history. And it's a tragedy and also an outrage certainly to the rule of international law. Of course, it's been barely noticeable in the media at a time when international law does not rule. And when the Security Council, the body entrusted by the UN Charter to save us from the, the scourge of war, is not fit for purpose. The bombing of children and civilians war crimes committed by Russia, a permanent member, now by Israel, the war in Sudan, and so on, have dwarfed the annihilation of Nagora Karabakh. But it nonetheless cries out for study and analysis in the hope that it may live again as a warning not to put trust in the United Nations or in particular in Russia. I went to Nagorno-Karabakh several times in recent years on missions 
to report on its governance, its history, the status of its right to self-determination. It was work uh, I did for a case in the European Court of Human Rights, not in the end uh, needed, but it was submitted as advice. I was advising them then uh, to the Armenian and the Karabakh governments. They didn't heed it, apparently on advice from Russia, which didn't want Nagorno-Karabakh to assert its independence. So uh, it's ended up some years later and too late, in fact, in the Journal for Genocide Studies. Let me summarize the case for Artsakh independence. The area has always been occupied until a few weeks ago, overwhelmingly by Armenians. After the Russian annexation in 1805, in 1825, there was a very exhaustive census, which proves that Armenian families were in the great majority in the area. And that was still the case in 1921, when Lenin fatefully and wrongly allocated uh, it to Azerbaijan rather than Armenia. It said by some that he was influenced by Ataturk, who wanted to keep Armenia uh, powerless after the genocide of 1915. But nonetheless, Stalin in 1923 confirmed the mistake and set up Nagora Karabakh as an oblast with a large degree of anonymity. And over the next 75 years, the Azeris, of course, resettled families and tried to change this democratic a demographic. But when, by the time the USSR collapsed, it was still 75% Armenian. They voted, indeed, at first after the collapse to uh, join Armenia, faithfully, because they might have been safer had they done so. But then uh, they decided uh, to fight for independence, and they certainly did, ways that I'll describe in a moment. But in the meantime, by then, Artsakh had developed culturally and in other ways, somewhat differently to Armenia itself. Uh, De Waal, who is a leading commentator on Armenia, says uh, the Nagoro Karabakh Armenians were significantly different from the Armenians of Armenia. The Karabakh Armenians are highlanders, famous for their hospitality and heavy drinking. They have a Highlander's distrust of lowland Armenia and uh, their thick Karabakh dialect cannot always be understood. There's a military tradition similar to that of the Scots in the British Empire. So for, the, for, for me and other British people, it is a comparison that reverberates They're the Highlander Scots. And indeed, in my report, I did notice many differences in the events and the ideas that the two regions commemorate. Uh, they have many different laws and distinct court systems. They make stereotyping jokes about each other. Karabakh humor depicts Armenians as money grabbing while Armenians joke about the mulish stubbornness of Karabakhians. Armenians drink coffee while Karabakhians drink tea. Karabakhians have their national drink, which they consume excessively, a highly alcoholic mulberry liquor, which repels Armenians. And I must say myself, Karabakh is world famous for its unique carpets, which are not made in Armenia, and its cultural monuments, evincing 
up so many centuries of unique spiritual life. A subject of many books, modern day Karabekians are custodians of a remarkable and unique cultural heritage, a source of national pride, and of course, there no more. The NK flag, whilst in Armenian colours, has its unique carpet symbol superimposed, which is not dissimilar to the British Empire, former colonial countries which have the Union Jack in the corner of their flag. The coat of arms is very different, featuring the carpet motif and the out, outstretched wings of an eagle soaring in the Karabakh Mountains, along with the representation of a famous statue in Stel, in Stepanakat. So there was the difference, rather akin, as I say, to the Scotland and, and uh, England, and the basis, certainly the basis in quite a few countries for independence and self-determination. But what changed everything? and justifies the legal case for independence, the pogroms that began in Songhite and Baku. That was when the people in Karabakh formed a liberation army and fought quite heroically against Azerbaijani oppression. And uh, just uh, the most thing that remains in my mind, particularly, was the siege of Stepanakert that really was Guernica Brit small uh, because the Azeris up in Sushi above rained down bombs and missiles on schools, on hospitals. Uh, it was uh, a terrible uh, war crime. 2,000 people were killed, many children and innocent civilians. And that was something that um, lives on and can't be forgiven. Uh, there was a very daring counterattack used using a couple of old Russian abandoned, reconditioned Russian tanks that took sushi and changed the game. The other game changer, which is relevant, uh, is the corridor, the, the Azeris were attempting the war crime of starvation, starving as well as killing the people of Stepanaka, but they managed to get in food and fuel and medicine via a corridor, which became a humanitarian corridor uh, from Goris to Lackey, and that, uh, of course, ironically, was the uh, basis this year for the Azeri pretense uh, that it uh, required a blockade and invasion. It was a false claim. But back in 1991, the uh, corridor was the way in which the people of Stepanak kept alive while well, subject to this vile war crime by the Azeri forces. And by 1994, at least, the war was won by the Karabakh army. I investigated uh, its makeup. It was by and large made up of Karabakhian uh, citizens and together with uh, some from the diaspora. There was, there were some Armenians, but it, it was uh, genuinely uh, an Artsakh effort. So it really won its right to self-determination because the law does allow secession to people subject to persecution. The, uh, if a group is the victim of abuse of sovereign power. And let's remember that ostensibly, thanks to Stalin and Lenin, um, the Azerbaijan did have sovereignty by that, although 
I would argue that that ended with the democratic vote for independence in 1989 and 90. But uh, the, uh, the abuses of that power by serious breaches of fundamental rights, uh, the pogroms, the siege of Stepanaka and so on, they had the right to secede from the oppressor state. That's been laid down in international law in cases ever since 1916, and it's been applied more recently, in the case of East Timor, which was entitled to secede from Indonesia after it had been victim of um, atrocities by Indonesian army generals. It was applied to sections of former Yugoslavia and to Kosovo. Remember Kosovo, where the Albanian population had been denied their civil and political rights by the Milosevic regime, and they fought back. Just the Kosovo Liberation Army fighting back like the Karabakh Liberation Army. Well, after 1994, Gora Karabakh went to work on building its little democracy. I inspected it and reported on it uh, in 2013. Parliamentary elections were held. They did have a democratic, I met many of their MPs and their president. Uh, there was an independent judiciary, which was particularly a matter of concern. I spoke to many of the lawyers there that had a law society of about 40 uh, who were service, servicing that judiciary. And, you know, as areas could still win their cases, those who had stayed. But unfortunately, and, and there was a free press. So we did have a democracy which was although supported by Armenia, it had, it was Armenians who were as separate as the Scottish are from the English and other countries had that difference. So um, the problem, of course, was that no other country recognized it. And this was always the problem that existed but it was not recognized. And I don't understand why in this period of uh, 1994 to 2023, this case was not made wherever possible. One reason, of course, that it wasn't was the um, fact that Nagura Karabakh was, despite its function in democracy was not permitted to join the Minsk process. This was absurd because the process was meant to be proceeding towards uh, peace in the Gora Karabakh. Of course, it wasn't um, driving, you had to drive. There was a lovely little airport at Stepanaka, but it couldn't fly any planes because the Azeris had credibly threatened to shoot them down. And then, of course, uh, so that was one problem. And then the other problem was that in 1993 and four, the Security Council, in an effort to get the peace, keep the peace, had referred to Nagora Karapak as under the sovereignty of Azerbaijan. And it had done that without investigation, without any discussion, but uh, in order to persuade uh, to peace. So we come to this year's events. I'm not going to detail them, but Nagora Karabakh surrendered, or was surrendered in order to save lives at the beginning 
of an unlawful act of aggression after another unlawful act lasting several months of blockading and trying to starve the people by blocking the lacking humanitarian corridor. Russia betrayed Armenia by refusing to do its duty to keep the peace and uh, probably in order to abuse Armenia after it began to criticize Russia for its own illegal aggression in Ukraine. Russia has always been the albatross around Armenia's neck and uh, selling its weapons to fight the Azeris, then selling the very same weapons to back you at a higher price. So Jeffrey. if these events put an end, yes, I know, I'm coming to an end. Thank you. Uh, put an end to Russian influence, well and good. But in the meantime, let us continue to commemorate Karabakh, the country in the clouds that was never allowed to fulfill its destiny. Thank you so much. We'll now uh, turn to uh, Ani, uh, Ani Ohanya. Ani. Thank you. Uh, let me share my presentation. Good. While conducting research on Bolshevik Kemalist relations, it quickly became apparent that the events occurring between 1917 to 1923 were not only turbulent and violent, but also directly responsible for both the Soviet conquest of the South Caucasus, as well as the origins of the nagorno karabakh conflict. Generally, the Karabakh issue is cast as a post-Soviet problem, but I aim to challenge this notion and reframe the historiography by highlighting its flashpoint. When considering the aggressions from a century ago in Harapah as part of a lengthy process of violence, we can draw new conclusions about the consequences and future of the current situation. To the world, it gradually became apparent that the Lachin Corridor crisis was a humanitarian issue involving ethnic cleansing. In August, Luis Moreno Ocampo issued a report deeming the deliberate blockade as genocide. As the Gharapov conflict strongly conjures the 1915 genocide, it too is a part of the process. The role of Turkish authoritarian rule serves as a constant, permeating the South Caucasus and enabling mobilization and for genocide to ensue. I am using the term Turkish authoritarian rule as it applies to the historical period of this conflict. Before regional analysis, it is important for me to briefly mention what shapes Turkish authoritarian rule in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as this aspect, along with geopolitical realities, plays a role in the violence targeted towards Armenians. At the turn of the century, the Ottoman Empire experienced ebbs and flows in its political stability with changes of power from Sultan Abdul Hamid II to the Young Turks and finally to Mustafa Kemal. Each sought to strengthen and restore Ottoman society in various ways, but all shared the same objective, to preserve the empire at all costs and settle the Armenian question. To curb European involvement within the empire, Abdul Hamid II organized mass violence against the Armenian population, known as the Hamidian massacres between 1894 to 1896. During that period, even Turkish students and intellectuals found themselves exiled in Europe, where they began to form a new school of Ottoman thought. Eventually, this would lead to the 1908 revolution in which the Committee of Union and Progress Party, also known as the Young Turks, would depose the Sultan to revive constitutionalism. Yet, the Young Turks faced similar issues with a seriously staggered geopolitical situation in the aftermath of the Balkan Wars between 1912 to 1913, leading the Minister of War and Ved Pasha to make the decision to join the First World War on Germany's side, hoping to curtail European involvement in the empire, and leading Interior Minister Talat Pasha to begin deporting Armenians en masse under the pretext of security concerns. The events that followed would come to be known as the Armenian Genocide. But again, I would like to emphasize the process. Understanding perpetrator rationale and behavior allows, us, allows for us 
to view the Armenian genocide as a broader phenomenon, not strictly confined to 1915. After all, the atrocities would continue beyond the borders of the Ottoman Empire, and Armenians would be targeted by Azerbaijanis who harbored pan-Turkic and or nationalist sentiments. When we consider the more recent events, especially the deliberate blockade of the Lachian Corridor, we can see the extended genocidal project taking place with similar motives. After defeat in the First World War to gain traction for the Kemalist movement, the Kemalists had to shift the balance of power. Collaboration with the Russians, old Ottoman foes, would evade Western involvement and permit the Kemalists to determine the fate of the Turkish nation. The Mudros Armistice, signed October 30, 1918, entailed European occupation and future partition of the Ottoman Empire. There were also warrants for the arrest of the leading genocide perpetrators for the 1915 massacres, noted as a crime against humanity by the British and the French. Germany, however, safeguarded these war criminals while other perpetrators remained within the fragile Ottoman Empire and became embroiled in the Turkish Liberation War, or rather Mustafa Kemal Pasha's Turkish nationalist movement. The objectives were first and foremost to preserve Anatolia and to utilize pan-Turk and pan-Islamic ideas as mobilizing tools to combat both the Western and Eastern fronts, mainly against the Greeks and Armenians respectively. Some scholars make a distinction between Turkism, which is a deep sense of heritage for the Turks, and Pan-Turkism, which seeks to unite Turkish people throughout Central Asia under Ottoman guidance. Because young Turk members fled the empire, they were active abroad in various circles. Enved Pasha is an example of someone who does not abandon his dream of a Pan-Turk state, but also begins to correspond with European socialists and the Bolsheviks. In October 1917, Bolshevik revolutionaries managed to topple three centuries of Russian imperial rule, sending the Caucasus, South Caucasus into a freefall. European imperialists were keen to exploit the South Caucasus for resources and greater spheres of influence. The French, British, and Germans all arrived in the region between December 1917 and May 1918. May 1918 marked a distinct turning point in the South Caucasus as three nascent republics emerged, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. Through national cohesion and motivation, the Armenians managed to combat the Ottoman Turks at Sartarabad. However, Armenia was not secure as there was ethno-territorial warfare on nearly all fronts in Georgia, Nahichevan, Zangezur, and Karabakh. During the summer of 1918, the Armenians of Karabakh established a provisional government whose goal was to achieve a self-governed system. Despite the surrender of Turkish troops after World War I, thousands of Turkish soldiers, officers, and military advisors, along with German officers, remained in the region to assist the pro-Turkish Azerbaijani government, known as the Musavats. On September 17, 1918, Baku fell to the Turks, resulting in massacres against the local Armenian population there. Five days later, a 4,000-man detachment arrived in Azerbaijan, commanded by Nuri Pasha, the half-brother of Enved Pasha. Their uncle, Khalil Bey, would also later work with Nuri Pasha, training Azerbaijani military units, preparing for pogroms against the Armenians. After the Ottomans lost the First World War, military activities and plans to salvage the Ottoman Empire did not subside. There was simply a shift in the balance of power with the British and French exercising greater authority in the Near East. In January 1919, the British approved Khorso Bek Sultanov as Karapal's governor general, in addition to Azerbaijani jurisdiction over the Zangezur region. Sultanov, whose origins are Kurdish, organized a Turkish-Kurdish cavalry to attack Armenian villages in Arapa. By June 1919, this cavalry was responsible for the murder of hundreds of Armenian inhabitants in Shushi, as well as surrounding villages, bringing the death toll to around 1,000. These pogroms demonstrate a violent continuity, not only from 1915, but also from the Hamidian massacres, in which Kurdish cavalry exterminated Armenian civilians and plundered Armenian property. 
It is also noteworthy that Sultanov was a fervent pan-Islamist himself who subscribed to pan-Turk ideologies. He was already in contact with former young Turk perpetrators prior to becoming governor general, and prominent Turkish intellectuals continued to act under the influence of these ideas by inciting attacks. The menacing situation forced Sadafa Armenians in August 1919 to recognize Azerbaijani sovereignty over the Ghadapah region, hoping to later resolve the issue at the Paris Peace Conference. Prior to Bolshevik Kemalist coalescence, young Turk members already acted as intermediaries for the Bolsheviks, influencing Azerbaijani government officials and the public that the Bolsheviks posed no threat to Azerbaijani independence. The Turks mobilized locals to carry out attacks against areas with significant Armenian populations. In March 1920, a deadly series of massacres took place in Shushi over the course of several days, with Turkish and Azerbaijani troops working together, murdering thousands of Armenians. The precise death toll is disputed, from figures ranging between 500 to 20,000. However, based on Russian population statistic records of Shushi, I would estimate several thousand victims, but I'm still researching archival materials to corroborate this claim. With a high concentration of Azerbaijanis in the Karapag region, the Bolsheviks found the opportune moment to take Baku, and on April 28, 1920, the Red Army proclaimed Azerbaijan a Soviet republic. Only a few weeks later, the Bolsheviks entered Ghadapak to prevent bloodshed, despite the Turkish-Azerbaijani coalition remaining active. Two days prior to the fall of Baku, Mustafa Kemal had written a letter to Vladimir Lenin, appealing for a partnership in the South Caucasus to blockade Western imperialists. Through the Bolsheviks, the Kemalists hoped to acquire funds to wage war, mostly in the form of gold and guns. And the Bolsheviks hoped that ties with the Kemalists would help spread Marxist internationalism to British occupied regions with significant Muslim populations. As early as July, the Kemalists were keen to attack Armenia, but the Bolsheviks did not feel it was the right time. The next month, however, in August 1920, the Treaty of Sevres would serve as the impetus for Kemalist attacks against the Dashnaks and Armenia as the treaty stipulated harsh terms for the partition of the Ottoman Empire, as well as trials for genocide perpetrators. Thus, with the commander of the Eastern Front, Kazim Karabekir, the Kemalists launched a major offensive against Armenia in September, 1920. The Armenians demanded that the Bolsheviks protect them, but in fact, the Kemalist invasion only facilitated Bolshevik conquest of Armenia. Exhausted and on the verge of defeat, the Armenian Dashnak government signed an agreement on December 2nd, 1920 to transfer power to Soviet Russia, who was considered the lesser evil relative to the Turks. Although Armenians had managed to resist in Zangezur, the Kemalists and Bolsheviks would attach the Nakhichevan and Garapar regions to Soviet Azerbaijan. Today in Nakhichevan, no Armenian population remains, and the Kemalist demands from 1921 enabled cultural genocide. After Soviet Russia conquered the entire South Caucasus region, there were talks between the Bolsheviks and Kemalists that produced the Treaty of Gars, finalized and ratified in October 1921. The Kemalists had insisted that Nakhichevan must remain under Soviet Azerbaijan's control and could never be transferred to a third party, including Soviet Russia. Azerbaijan demonstrated a gross exploitation of its political control over the region by successfully raising all churches and destroying the symbols of Armenian heritage in the early years of Ilham Aliyev's rule. This has been documented by scholars and journalists, as you can see in this slide. This Nahichevan example highlights the importance of understanding today's ethno-territorial and geopolitical situation by looking back to the past. Unfortunately, there are too many examples for me to show, but I picked two. One is this village city, Arbakunis, and another is Agulis, which you can see a mosque has been built over where the Armenian church once was. For Harapa, the protracted conflict concluded last month, and we are observing an outcome very similar to Nahi Chevans. What will happen to the 4,000 churches in Harapa? If history is the antidote to prevent atrocity, then we should pay particular attention to Zangezur. 
In November 2020, after the ceasefire was signed, Ilham Aliyev began to discuss Zangezur as an Azerbaijani ethno-territorial space. Considering my earlier mention of British-approved Azerbaijani jurisdiction over Zangezur in 1919, Hosro Sultano's unsuccessful attacks on Zangezur, Armenian communities, and more recent provocations, such as the January 2022 attack on Sunik, there is much at stake for Azerbaijan's geopolitical interests. Henceforth, the undermining of history and democratic values will persist as authoritarian and neocolonial dimensions weigh heavily onto the South Caucasus. Thank you. Thank you, Ani. Uh, I believe we can now ask uh, Bedros Dermatosian to speak. Bedros. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, I just came back from teaching. I had to cut the teaching <laughs> earlier. So, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Zorian Institute, uh, Kurkin Sarkisian, Megan Reed, uh, for putting together this excellent uh, uh, project of publishing special issue on the uh, launching uh, blockade and its repercussions. Of course, when the issue came up, it was the blockade was still going on, and until the last minute, we didn't know how to frame it. Was it open or closed? Or and and uh, you know, towards the end of my article, I said that the end result might be either ethnic cleansing or maximum uh, maximum genocide by attrition and minimum uh, ethnic cleansing. So uh, thank you all. Thank you also, Mark, for uh, inviting me uh, as uh, Nasser Spon co sponsor. Uh, first of all, I'll start uh, dealing with the specific thing here, defining the crime and what happened today, uh, then going on on the three important aspects of the article, which are uh, impunity, uh, lack of humanitarian intervention, and lastly, international apathy. Uh, one thing I'd like to reiterate again that is being raised in international media, Armenians did not flee, they were forcefully displaced as part of an ethnic cleansing process, which uh, reached its end a few months ago. Ethnic cleansing as a concept has not been recognized as an independent crime under international law. So it's not a crime under international law. The term surface in the context as all of you know, 1990s in former Yugoslavia. At the time, United Nations Commission of Experts mandated to, take, to look into violations of international law committed in the territory of former Yugoslavia. In its final report, the commission stated, uh, described ethnic cleansing as, and I quote, a purpose, purposeful policy designated by one ethnic or religious group to remove by violent and terror inspiring means the civilian population of another ethnic or religious group from certain geographic area. The UN definition of genocide in 1948 defines the other question, whether what happened in the case of the, sorry, in the case of Artsakh, does it, is it a genocide itself? I argue that it is an ethnic cleansing, which began as genocide by attrition and ended up as an ethnic cleansing. In defining genocide by attrition, noted scholar of genocide studies, Helen Fine, the sociologist, comments as follows, and I quote, genocide by attrition occurs after a group is signaled singled out for political and civil discrimination. It is separated from the larger society and its right to life is threatened through concentration and forced displacement together with systematic deprivation of food, water and sanitary and medical facilities. These measures along with the frequent imposition of a crowded living quarters lead to death through diseases and starvation. These actions, she argues, violate Article 2 of the UN Genocide Convention, specifically causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group and deliberately inflicting on group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. So I argue that whatever was happening with the lodging blockade at the time was genocide by attrition, and it ended up with an ethnic cleansing. So there are, I argue that there are three important core denominators that connects the past mass violence that have been committed against Armenians uh, in the Hamidian massacres, in the Adana massacres during the Armenian genocide and the recent 
uh, uh, Artsakh uh, ethnic cleansing. The first is impunity. Generally speaking, impunity refers to an offender who causes harm to another person and escapes justice. When we apply this situation to intergroup conflict, the perpetrator in the case commits crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocides against another group and escapes punishment. In such cases, the perpetrator capitalizes on their international status, power, advantage, and is able to achieve impunity and escape justice through a series of tactics that include, but not limited to denial, intimidation, cunning diplomatic maneuver and manipulation of bystanders, or capitalizing on their inaction. Thus, the bystanders in action plays an important role in the process of achieving impunity. Impunity does not only release the perpetrator from uh, any responsibility and accountability for their crimes, but emboldens them to commit future acts of violence against the targeted group. Aliyev's despotic regime was encouraged to perpetrate more acts of crime when it saw, when it, it enjoyed a climate of impunity. So in covering the three cases, the four cases, it, during the Hamidian massacre, the perpetrators in, enjoyed impunity. There wasn't any justice delivered to the, to the, to the uh, victims of the Hamidian massacres. No one was uh, brought to justice. The same regarding the Adana massacres, I argue, despite the fact that there were court martials following the Adana massacres, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the chief architects of the Adana massacres were not brought to justice. They received very light sentences, hence creating an environment of impunity. And in the uh, following the Armenian genocide in the military tribunals of 1919, those who were the real architects of the genocide have escaped justice, most of them uh, fleeing to Berlin and the Caucasus. So that creates a kind of the idea of impunity that still continues, uh, continues today when there are no measures or punishments that have been, uh, it, 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 that have been applied on criminals or on uh, regimes even, despotic regimes, that regimes uh, chances of perpetrating more acts of crime becomes more probable. And to that extent, even after the ethnic cleansing, there is high probability that the uh, Azerbaijani uh, despotic regime might initiate another attack, this time on the, uh, on the region of Sunik, with the aim of pushing Armenia to open the Lachin Corridor, and not Lachin, sorry, the Zankezur Corridor, and also claiming the eight uh, so-called villages that, that supposedly were part of other region. The second important aspect to discuss here is humanitarian intervention. Humanitarian intervention is a term that came to be coined in the 19th century. The aim, was, the aim was to intervene by European powers to stop or to prevent the occurrence of massacres or even after the massacres to prevent future acts of massacres to take place. And we see that humanitarian intervention took place in the case of Greece, in the case of Bulgaria, in the case of Crete, but not in the Armenian case. In the three Armenian cases of violence, the Hamidian massacres, the Adana massacres and the Armenian genocide, there wasn't any humanitarian attention and humanitarian intervention taking place. Scholars such as Keith Wotempo, Davide Rodongno, uh, uh, Michel Toussaint, uh, and many others allude to the fact that humanitarian intervention took place as long as all the powers intervened were on the same page. In the case of Armenians, it seems that all, all the powers were not on the same page, that no one is going to benefit out of that intervention. Hence, Armenians have always been in a very a problematic position between Russia and the West, and that played an important role in not intervening. The last aspect is the aspect of international apathy. International apathy means international disregard as to what's happening. The uh, hierarchy of suffering is decided here by the European media and European states as to who is suffering the most today in the world. So for a couple of years, Ukraine has uh, covered the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the top of the pyramid. And international apathy has existed in the course of the suffering of the Armenians with a specific difference. 
that uh, the during the Hamidian massacres, during the Adana massacres, and during the uh, Armenian genocide. The topic of the Armenian persecutions and the Armenian suffering and the massacres were covered on daily newspapers, be it in Omaha here in Nebraska, to Boston, to Wisconsin, to Wyoming. Everyone knew that an Armenian genocide was taking place. In the case of the blockade of the Lachin Corridor, and that's the crucial aspect, it's the blockade that we're interested. There wasn't any coverage by the international media. On the contrary, we have the uh, total silence and disregard as to what was happening towards the Armenians who were now being, who were experiencing uh, genocide by attrition. What we see is that after the last three weeks before the second war on September 17, 2023, is that the last three weeks suddenly the international press started realizing that something is going on. I call this ex post facto syndrome of condemnation. This ex post facto syndrome of condemnation by Western powers has become the fashion now. Too late. These types of articles only help to raise awareness about the plight of the Armenians and put pressure maybe on Aliyev. Yet, as we know from history, despotic leaders and regimes do not care about the opinion of international media, especially when uncles like Erdogan and Putin are back backing you. So this ex post syndrome of condemnation does not help Armenians. When the event has already taken place, you cannot reverse it, all right? So always now interviewing refugees who came to Armenia and showing you the suffering of Armenia. So there is kind of, uh, uh, there is kind of mis, uh, intentionally misrepresentation of what's happening towards Armenians. So basically coming to a, a, a short conclusion, uh, during the phases of violence that has been inflicted on Armenians, maybe due to also geographic location of Armenians, it was never in the interest of the major powers, whether it's Russia on the one hand or the Europeans on the other hand, to help the Armenians in any way. Armenia, as I always say, does not have any allies. Those people who think the West is the ally and we should deviate to the West are, I think, uh, misled. The same regarding those who think that the answer is in Putin's hand. So Armenia is alone and has been alone all the time. It doesn't have any friends and it, it should rely on itself, I think. Uh, so to that extent, all these three common denominators, apathy, though it was sympathy during the Armenian genocide, but lack of humanitarian intervention and impunity has emboldened those who perpetrated acts against Armenians to continue and perpetrate more acts against Armenians, all right? And uh, hopefully this impunity is not going to lead to another major attack on Armenia, this time on this unique region. Thank you, Mark. Pedros, thank you very much. Uh, let's now conclude with uh, Henry's presentation. And uh, again, to the audience members, uh, some of you have, are already doing so. But if you wish to uh, submit questions, please use the Zoom Q&A and following Henry's talk, we will, we will get to as many of those as possible. Uh, thank you, just uh, trying to get my uh, slideshow going here. Um, and I can share. Are you able to see? I'm sorry, I'm trying to get this. Yes. Okay. And then, From the okay. Head. How's that looking? Good. Ad advance it. And let's just make sure. Did it advance? Yes. Okay. Oh, perfect. Great. Sorry, I've had uh, some bad experiences with Zoom uh, slideshows. Um, anyway, I, I really appreciate the the previous three. Um, uh, presentations um, and and um, I should note. I strongly encourage people to look carefully at the special issue. I'm going to give a little bit of a background on that now. Um, one of the one of the uh, very oh, sorry. Uh, one of the very important uh, aspects of this was it was intended to focus primarily on the blockade as an immediate 
ongoing human rights issue in its own right and not to get swallowed up in obviously a, a much broader set of human rights abuses, including genocide against Armenians historically and, and in recent years. Um, fortunately, the authors each addressed their topic in a way that connected the present very particular issue of the blockade to that broader context. And that makes the special issue still very relevant um, as I think the three presentations we've seen today very relevant to what's going on um, for Armenia right now. Um, this special issue is not obsolete with the blockade, uh, with the end of the blockade. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, I, I have to say, just by context, um, we had maybe a little hope that despite how quickly we were trying to get the special issue together, that by the time it came out, uh, it would be obsolete in that the international community and even Azerbaijan would have given up the blockade. Um, little did we know that within a relatively short time after the special issue came out, yes, the blockade was finished. It was finished because Azerbaijan escalated to a new and, and more direct level um, of violence. Um, I wanna highlight that we had three authors who are not here today, um, Aaron Marsubian, uh, Karen Avedisian and Lindsay Snell, and I and I really recommend you reading their pieces in addition to um, Bedros, Ani, and, and Jeffrey Robertson. They're they're um, excellent in their own right, um, and just want to highlight that that I appreciate that Bedros and and Ani and and Jeffrey also went beyond the specifics of their um, written work in the special issue to add something today uh, to update for the the current context. Um, but I would recommend again that, that that suggests that going back to their original articles will be also very fruitful for you because there are things that you would not have gotten today that are in there that I think are very relevant. Um, I, I want to start off with a, a question um, to try to understand the shift from the blockade to where we are now. Um, and I'm picking up on uh, Deborah Meyerson's on the timing of genocide. Um, as well as Vak and Dadrian's analysis of the way that that um, violence towards genocide escalates in 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 complex ways. Um, why did Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan end the blockade through elimination of the target population? Um, it's easy to say, and it's true, but it's easy to say that this was because there was a genocidal or eliminationist plan um, all along. Um, that that that's what the goal was. Um, I think that's true. Um, but I think that we also need to understand that part of what happened was the blockade failed. Um, strange as it is, it is to say that, um, and as devastating as it was for Armenians um, in Artsakh, they refused to leave um, even after nine months. I, I believe that Azerbaijan thought that more Armenians would leave and that Armenian, that, that Azerbaijan, uh, that, that the Artsakh um, Armenians would be broken through the blockade. I don't think they were quite prepared for the resilience of Armenians. Um, and that's why they were pushed into, I won't say pushed into, they chose to, but that's why they had to go to a direct military option. Um, what's telling about that is that direct military option reveals the violence that was behind the blockade all along. Um, people adopt, or perpetrators adopt methods of destruction that are as invisible as they can be in the circumstances. Um, we've talked about genocide by attrition, for instance, today and so forth. Um, perpetrators try to be efficient quite often in what they're doing. If the blockade succeeded, it was a way of, of committing violence without the level of direct military violence that ultimately was necessary. Um, Azerbaijan was not able to accomplish its goals that way. And so it escalated to a level of direct violence, which is what we've what we've seen in the last six weeks, and and I believe um, we'll continue to see against the Armenian Republic itself um, in the coming weeks and months. Um, I should note um, that one of the the telling elements of what has gone on, particularly since 2020, um, has been the presence of an explicitly genocidal ideology. I think Bedros had a very nuanced way of talking about the shift from genocide by attrition to ethnic cleansing, that is the depopulation of an area by forcing people out physically. 
Um, but I do want to highlight that throughout this process, there has been um, the presence of explicit statements, not just of hatred against Armenians, not just of anti-Armenian prejudice, but direct statements um, by Aliyev Erdogan and others that their goal is to eliminate Armenians from the Caucasus, um, that they believe Armenians need to be eliminated. Um, this created a really interesting and unfortunate double bind for Armenians, um, which is one of the tricks of international law. Um, most international legal discussions of genocide end up turning to some extent on proof of intent. Um, this is why genocide is so hard to prove in, in international law, because proving intent is very difficult in most circumstances. In this case, you had outright statements of intent to commit genocide, of a genocide, genocide ideology, but these were typically dismissed. Um, in that sense, Armenians could not win, right? If the statements weren't made, Armenians would have no proof of genocidal intent. But the fact that they were made um, ended up being dismissed. And again, Armenians had no proof of genocidal intent because the intent was not, was not allowed to be taken seriously. And I just had a meeting uh, a couple months ago with a representative in US Congress, um, William Keating in Massachusetts. And he made the comment that, oh, all those statements of genocidal ideology, whatever, that's just um, Aliyev just being extreme. He's got to learn to shut up. He doesn't really mean them. He's just a, you know, that's the kind of way he operates. Going through this a little bit um, further, um, understanding that this was, this is, in my opinion, um, a case of genocide as part of a process. Um, we have to ask the question of why Armenians have, why Armenians in Artsakh and why Armenians in the Republic today are in the position and have been in the vulnerable position that they've been in. Um, I want to say very quickly that Armenians are not exceptional. This is the norm of victims of genocide, slavery, colonialism, conquest, militarism, capitalist exploitation, and, and other historical forces. This is what they do. Victims of genocide become dramatically weaker than they were before. And let's not forget, for genocide to be successful against them, they had to start off as significantly weaker than the perpetrators. Um, Armenians are in the position in, in significant part because of the legacy of multiple genocides um, and, and the failure to repair the, those, um, the impacts. Um, there's no way we have time to get into a full discussion of the impacts of 1915, um, particularly 1915 to 23, particularly in the failure to repair. But I will just highlight two very important features of the failure to repair. One is that Turkish society, and by extension, Azeri society, and I'll get to why that's significant in a moment, never went through a process of rehabilitation. The modern Turkish Republic was formed through the genocidal process. Its economic basis was expropriated Armenian, Greek, and Assyrian property. Um, its, its national ideology was formed through anti-Armenianism and, and, and um, destruction. Um, and it, you know you can trace particular perpetrators um, and others uh, from 1915 as some of the architects of the 1923 Republic that shaped the, the military, political, educational, and even cultural institutions and structures. Um, that's very important to understand. The genocidal mentality that's embedded in Turkey did not go away. Secondly, one very key um, element of any um, uh, significant reparative process is the, um, the security, future security of the population rendered vulnerable through genocide. The fact that Turkey and its ally Azerbaijan have done the opposite, whereas I would argue Turkey has a special responsibility to protect Armenia, to prevent exactly what's happened. In fact, it should have gone to war with Azerbaijan to prevent the invasion of Artsakh, quite the opposite. Turkey um, has, has not only not guaranteed the security of Armenia, but it has actively um, uh, uh, attacked that security. Um, I, I just wanna add a, a, another thing. In the 2015 um, report that I did uh, with um, Alfred Desaius, Arababian, and Jermaine McAlpin um, on uh, sort of proposal for reparations of, the, of 
for the 1915 genocide, um, we argued that without a reparative process at this point in the present, our, the Armenian Republic likely had about 50 years left. Um, and there were features and trends that would support that. Um, in 2020, I individually revised that after the 2020 war to probably 20 years. If we're looking at what's happened in the recent, um, in, the, in, the, in the last six weeks, I would argue less. What we're facing is an exterminatory process and there is absolutely no doubt that that's accelerating. I want people to be very clear about that. Um, one out of few things, Mark, how am I doing for time since I can't check? Okay, uh, 10 minutes left or 10 minutes done? 10 minutes done, okay, thank you. Um, very quickly, I just wanna talk about a few reasons that the process that Armenians are facing right now um, is not being properly understood and represented in a way that it should be as part of a long-term genocidal process that should trigger not only international legal um, uh, intervention, but also political and, and other um, interventions and prevention efforts. Um, there are all sorts of ways in which, um, obviously, um, Azerian Turkish propaganda denial and so forth um, have had a huge impact. Um, I think Lindsay Snell's piece in the special issue does a particularly impressive job of uncovering the incredible subtlety through which um, Azeri propaganda uh, relative to the blockade functioned and how effective it was. Um, but I would add um, two other key pieces. One is Armenians are part of uh, an unfortunately large group of targeted um, uh, victim groups that experience a kind of double marginalization. Not only are they the victims of violence in the contemporary period in the past with all the implications of that, but their particular victimization, and Bedros highlighted this in his talk, is excluded from central discussion in the international community or in the case of, of the US, if we look at Native Americans, for instance, in domestic discussions. Um, this adds a particular burden. Armenians are not part of the small chosen group of people whose, uh, who, whose experience of violence becomes the focus of international uh, political scrutiny. Um, and we can talk about why that is, but I think understanding that reality um, is, is really important. Um, another aspect of this that I think is really important is the failure of concepts of genocide as they typically are, uh, are understood to get at what is actually happening here. We generally understand genocide as a single and even singular event. It's an exception, an aberration in history. It happens to a group by a perpetrator and that experience of that group is relatively unique in its history. Um, once it's over, despite the consequences of that, it is over. Um, we, that model, which is dominant, even though it's wildly inaccurate, if you look historically at most um, trends of genocide of the overall history of genocide, fails to recognize historical con continuation and continuities, um, not only uh, as prevalent or even as an exception, it doesn't even go that far. Um, I would argue there are a number of dimensions of genocide that are relevant to the, to the process that Artsakh Armenians are facing and Armenia in general right now is facing. Um, first, we have to understand serial genocide as a very typical mode. We can look at US history, the US history of genocide against group after group after group. We can even look at Germany going from the Herero to the Holocaust. In the case of, of um, Turkey, we can see repeated genocides against Armenians and other groups. Um, and shifts even against, I don't know if it's fully genocidal, but shifts to mass violence and oppression against Kurds. Perpetrators can be serial perpetrators, and this makes dealing with them much more complicated than what we'll call one-off perpetrators. In the case of, for instance, um, uh, uh, um, well, I hesitate to say this, the Khmer Rouge, for instance, as one of the rare examples of a one-off perpetrator. Um, we also have to recognize, and this is also very important for this case, trans-perpetrator genocide. Genocide, individual victim groups are often targeted by multiple groups. We often misunderstand the Holocaust because we see it in essence as a Nazi-driven uh, genocide. But if you look at the patchwork or the, the rather large range of perpetrator groups that were involved across Europe, 
It was actually a multi or trans perpetrator genocide. And finally, we have to understand um, reiterative genocide, or what I'm terming reiterative genocide. That is genocide that happens in episodes over a long period of time. I listed the, case, the Armenian case is an easy one. Um, Bedros, if you go to his article in the special issue, does an excellent job of addressing these different periods. Um, and, and I think it's a very important contribution to this. Um, and we need to understand that what Armenians are going through at the very least is both reiterative, um, that there may have been stalls or static periods in Turkish genocide of Armenians. Um, there are situational factors and even internal pressure on Turkey, say in the early you know, 2000s to maybe 2014, that militated against direct genocide. And as those have shifted, we've seen a return to more explicitly genocidal processes. We also have to understand in this case that we're dealing with the trans perpetrator genocide. Um, and I'll just say that Azerbaijan since the 1990s has adopted or readopted um, a, a Turkish genocidal anti-Armenian um, ideology that has become central to its own national identity. And so what we have seen as even as in Turkey, the genocidal um, attitudes have, have remained embedded within society that has been re-exported back to Azerbaijan, originally came from Azerbaijan, though it's another, con uh, another discussion, have been exported to Azerbaijan and adopted there. And this makes the situation even more complicated for, Mar for Armenians because you're not dealing with one single state or one single perpetrator. Um, and I'll let this go, um, the, the what next, maybe we can get to in the questions and answers. Thank you, Henry, and thank you uh, to all the panelists for your, for your presentations. And, and again, I want to uh, likewise reiterate that uh, we'd encourage you to check out the, the journal issue and again, the link to get access to purchase copies rather uh, of it is in the webinar chat. So please do look into that. So we have quite a few questions uh, from members of the audience and let's try to get to, to some of these. Um, the first one is for uh, Jeffrey Robertson. Um, who I don't see anymore, but I hope, oh, he is still there. Excellent, very good. Uh, I'm sorry. The, the question is about the role uh, of and the hypocrisy of international organizations such as the UN uh, and others who recognize Kosovo, but not Artsakh. Can, from a legal standpoint, can you, can you explain this difference in, in uh, treatment? I don't know whether you can see me. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but we can no longer see you, Jeffrey. Let me see. Is that no? <laughs> Is that better? That's good. Uh, sorry, would you repeat the question? I mean, the sure. The the uh, difference in, in I, was not, I thought it was an hour. Ah, the, the, the difference in legal status in terms of international recognition between Kosovo on the one hand and Artsakh on the other. Why and... and Yes. Well, it's very simple, isn't it? Uh, Kosovo had the support of America and of Britain and France. Armenia was unable to get the, put the support behind Artsakh. It uh, never made, uh, and partly because of Russia. I mean, it, Armenia's tragedy from the beginning has been the influence of Russia, the control of Russia sometimes, the international sense that uh, Armenia is in the Russian camp, uh, as it was by signing a number of treaties with Russia. So that prevented Artsakh, although, frankly, I've been to both countries. It was uh, a far less corrupt, a far better democracy than Kosovo. But Kosovo had the support uh, 
Armenia, or rather Nagorno-Karabakh, was tarred with the Russian brush. And that was unfortunately why it didn't have the support. It should have had the support in getting on the Minsk process. It should have had the support um, in order to wean it away from Russian influence. One of the uh, ironies is that at the very end, it's vote rightly, uh, justly against Russia over the resolution condemning it at the UN uh, was perhaps the final, uh, the reason why Putin broke off and uh, didn't protect it. Thank you. Uh, we have a question directed to to Ani, uh, and and if others would like to join in as well regarding the possibility of the imminent threat to the uh, the to Zangazur uh, Sunni region, um, is is this a legitimate concern in the immediate term, or or is again as as Henry uh, uh, talked about, is this merely rhetorical? Uh, this is an imminent concern in that if you look at the, the historical process and what has transpired in the past, this has always been, say, on the minds of uh, Azerbaijanis and Turks. And now in more recent discussions, we've seen why it might serve uh, geopolitical um, strategy for Azerbaijan. And again, I want to emphasize that when they, Azerbaijan will find moments of disarray to reinvigorate, say, the population. This, what Henry also pointed out, this um, underdeveloped sense of nationalism in the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, genocide was used and it was reiterated as a way to build it. And of course, the economic uh, factors for Azerbaijan changed as well. Unfortunately for Armenia, the dependence on Russian energy and economic uh, factors have sort of bounded them towards Russia. Over the last couple of years with Pashinyan and a shakeup of power, this has dramatically altered the relationship. If there was say a, a friend relationship, I would argue it's a little more geopolitical and trans transactional. But in recent media, um, a lot of I, I follow a lot of uh, French uh, news. I, obviously, as Pedro said, we don't get very much coverage in the United States. But in France, um, the mayor of Paris had gone over during the summer and Hidalgo to the Arapao region. And so France has been actually talking about this recently. And uh, journalists go there actively. They've been interviewing um, the Arapaoists who have left Artsakh over this last couple of weeks and very heartbreaking stories. But uh, many people do believe that this is not the end of the road. And yes, Henry mentioned that as well, that now there, there is less time. What remains very grim is that we can think, well, what do we do from here? Because it's true that Armenia does not have the support of the international community. And even when a country like France says that Armenia is their friend, you still have this uh, idea about questions about why European nations or, or Western countries aren't sanctioning Azerbaijan as well, uh, even though they are, say, taking Russian oil and uh, selling it. And Europeans right now are continuing to do transactions with Azerbaijan because they believe this is somehow more moral. Um, so this is, again, one of the uh, sad situations when with Artsakh, it just doesn't seem to get as much of the attention. Just to add, Mark, I think there is a minute threat uh, I follow the Turkish and Azerbaijani news, and there's a lot of discourse there that the business is not done yet and still need to get our, our quote unquote territories. Uh, I mean, even Sunik supposedly belongs to uh, Azerbaijan. So there is this type of discourse that's being raised, and I think and the additional eight villages apparently, but I, did, I think that it's all meant to force Armenia to open the uh, Zankezur corridor uh, by, and even if they attack Armenia, I don't think Russia is going to do anything. So that's uh, another thing. And I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, uh, France is 
providing uh, defensive, uh, you know, uh, weapons to Armenia. At least it can defend itself from uh, any imminent attack. I think Henry has raised his hand. No, no. Just to add to that, I think it is significant that that what we're seeing right now is a shift of the locus of genocide to Azerbaijan from Turkey. Turkey is fully supportive. The real um, the the claims on Armenian territory, which are different from uh, what's termed Western Armenia, which was depopulated through the 1915 genocide, those claims are being primarily made by Azerbaijan, and 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 that is to Armenia, right? That's to the Armenian Republic, significant parts of it. It was to Artsakh and so forth. And whether they're acting in some sense from the Turkish view as a proxy. Um, or the, the, the sort of locus of, of um, genocidal intensity has shifted to Azerbaijan and Turkey is sort of tagging along and, and, and sort of using that um, is, is unclear. Um, but we should note that, 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 that um, it, it really things are being driven to some extent by Azerbaijan right now. Um, and, and that is, you know, that raises some, some challenges. So this then leads to another question, um, which is, which I'm boiling down. What what can legally and enforceably be done now to safeguard, safeguard Armenia against attack? And I, I I take the spirit of that question to be referring to in international law and diplomacy rather than through uh, military means. But obviously, military means. Uh, have to enter into it as well. So what can Armenia do to protect itself as a legal entity uh, through through law and diplomacy? Anyone? Well, it can, I suppose, beef up the line of conflict, uh, mm. which makes a trip by car via Mount Ararat, uh, difficult in any case, and I don't know where the road will end, whether it will end at Goris or whether uh, there will be uh, some kind of border post manned by the Azeri army that will stop cars just as they, but maybe they'll open the airport, who knows? But, uh, I think in international law, I think it's worth pursuing uh, a, a, some kind of reference to the International Criminal Court because the war crimes committed in this undeclared war were um, the, the blockade, which is a crime of threatening starvation, and the aggression that was committed by the uh, Aziris, as I understand it, I'm not familiar with the second minute by minute uh, analysis, but it certainly seemed to me that there was uh, a crime of aggression committed. So I think keeping those uh, alive is important to keep Azerbaijan on the back foot. Then, of course, there are um, questions of seizure of property, which could be uh, under the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, the Protocol 1, uh, protects property, and we have to see what eventuates. I assume uh, an Azeri commission will seize all the property. And there are examples of uh, taking action in international courts in relation, for example, to Cyprus. And so it may be that there are, but obviously people should sit down and think of all the ways in which the Aziri illegal assault can be mitigated. They can't, uh, it, may, it may eventually be 
phases can be won that do something to reverse the situation. But uh, at the moment, uh, it's a long-term goal. Henry, you would also like to say something? Yeah, can I just add, add, add a quick note? Um, uh, uh, and again, <laughs> very small uh, uh, addition to, to uh, Mr. Robertson's point. Um, I don't think what we saw um, with the blockade and, and um, you know, in particular, was a failure of international law. Let's not forget, relatively early in the blockade process, there was an ICJ order uh, to end the blockade. Um, and I was actually surprised that that happened. Um, the ICJ is, is, I would argue, one of the more political uh, international courts in the sense that it does, uh, it, it's a state level court. It's not an individual court, it's not like the ICC. And it, it takes quite a bit, I think, in my opinion, to get it to, to render that kind of a decision. And it, and it gave an order. It's not a decision in the overall case, but it was an order to stop the blockade. Um, the real problem, was not with international law, it was with adherence by governments to international law. Um, and Ale Aliyev was very explicit in this. He said, look, I don't have to listen to international law. And if Armenians, I'm paraphrasing, but if Armenians are naive enough to think that appealing to international law is gonna save them, they're grossly mistaken because it's power that matters right now. The age of international law is over. Um, and that is one really disturbing, and we can debate legal, you know, deep questions about law and, and uh, you know, the powers behind international law and all those kinds of things. But, but I would argue that, that the spirit of international humanitarian law um, is, is a major positive. And if we're in an era where um, governments with significant, uh, a significant amount of power see themselves a, a, as able to treat international law as optional, um, the precedent that that's setting and the, and the implications of that, I think um, we're already starting to see, but it are extremely disturbing um, for the coming century, I would argue. So there are, there are further questions about um, the legal rights and ability of, uh, of Artsakh Armenians, or for that matter, Armenia itself, to make to to bring claims against Turkey or Azerbaijan, as far as that goes, uh, is there any basis for e even though Artsakh was not recognized as a state, uh, do they therefore lack any legal rights for uh, reparation or restitution or uh, you know return to their their homes? Well, it was uh, the rights are in the people, not in the state, which doesn't exist as far as uh, legal matters are concerned. A state of Artsakh could never get into court other than its own because it was not recognized as a state through, you could say, its own dereliction or through Russian interference. It didn't want it to be a state. Uh, whatever, that's perhaps not relevant now, but the people of Artsakh certainly can bring in certain circumstances which would need to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, but they can bring cases, uh, and if they can't, they can bring a case to the European Court of Human Rights on the basis that they have no effective remedy to the seizure of their homes or to the profits that they could have from their gardens or their fields. Uh, so yes, there should be uh, a <laughs> Armenian lawyers sitting down, seeing what the situation is and taking evidence from uh, people whose lands have been seized, I would have thought that you could, since it's unlikely that there will be a court system other than a rigged uh, Azerbaijani court, that it will be possible for those who have been victims of illegal aggression and have lost their homes in consequence to bring 
cases, it would take a few years, sadly, uh, bring cases to Strasbourg. That will be one. The other rather disquieting factor is that a number of politicians and judges have been arrested. And uh, if they, no doubt, can't get out, then there are several international courts, the UN Working Group on uh, Arbitrary Detention is one that is very good and very fast, uh, which should be used to uh, protect them. So there's a question here about, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm going to re rephrase it. Uh, <laughs> essentially, uh, should we understand the failure of this crisis to resonate in American or Western media generally as as a lack of uh, lack of interest in in this in this situation or in the region or should it be read as a uh, understanding the strength of uh, Azerbaijani um, PR and the relative weakness of uh, Armenian outreach? Does that make sense as a question? Yeah. Uh, Mark Azerbaijan has spent millions of dollars on heart burns, and uh, they are even for 2020 war, we saw clear cut bias towards Azerbaijan in, Azerbaijan in old international media. It's a very powerful country, has uh, oil. Uh, uses caviar diplomacy and has, uh, you know, specifically the British media to that extent has, you know, a, a major impact, uh, the major impact on the British media. Uh, 2020 war and then the blockade and even as, I, as I'm saying, the last three, three uh, uh, weeks they started, international media started paying attention that something is wrong here. Uh, Armenians, uh, unfortunately, the state of Armenia, the Republic of Armenia does not have that uh, international clout that Azerbaijan has, not because of its political system, its despotic regime, but due to its natural resources, oil. And oil as an energy plays an important role in dictating the other countries' behaviors, specifically at a time in which Ukraine is at war and Russian gas is being, uh, is being, directed through Azerbaijan to other countries, so diverted from Russia to Azerbaijan. So energy, natural resources, money, military power, backing by Russia too, those are important aspects of understanding, you know, why Armenia could not make a case in the international media. Well, there have been some. Uh, I managed to get an article uh, prominently in the Murdoch Press in Australia over the 2020, uh, it received a furious and uh, dishonest reply, which they had to publish from the Azerbaijani ambassador, but that's part of the fun. No one believed it. And so, but that was a war where people were killed and that made a difference. The problem with the this year's exercise the blockade, even though there was a malign intention behind it, is that there weren't people killed. There were not, it, it seemed to be at first, these fake environmental activists, which was very clever of the uh, Azerbaijani publicity. But uh, I did get a, a piece in The Independent, uh, but it had to uh, come in in a, a particular way. Um, I think it is nonetheless, uh, Azerbaijan is well known uh, to be corrupt. It has a terrible record in the European Parliament of trying to corrupt MPs, and we're going to see some trials to that effect later. So it's... Uh, it is still hopeful that the true uh, hatred of the uh, that is manifest by the Aleyevs and their deep corruption uh, will cause revisiting of what they did to Nagora Karabakh. 
Uh, there's one final question, and then then we will wrap up because it's been a long session and it's getting late in 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 the UK. Uh, Given the opportunity to write for uh, to an international or an American audience, what line of thought do you believe would best resonate with with this audience? Uh, in other words, given the opportunity to present the, the case for why people should care about this, uh, how do you make that case succinctly? I guess you make it for for America on the basis of those 4,000 churches. I mean, we're talking about a, a land that was the first in 301 to accept Christianity. We're talking about an extraordinary place with all these thousand year old churches, which American evangelicals ought to be concerned with. But we're talking about a culture. We're talking about people who, have produced a democracy, a funny little democracy, out of a past in which they've been uh, invaded by Russia, by Azerbaijan. And we talk about losing uh, a little bit of, the, of, of a variegated world. So I think if uh, some concentration on even if it's down to carpets, but not, I hope, on mulberry liqueurs. Everyone is invited to to make this pitch. Uh, who 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 else would like to? Uh... And mention Safarov. Mention Safarov, because that was the mm. most barbaric killing by an Azerbaijani of an Armenian, which was rewarded. He was actually promoted and and rewarded for killing uh, a man as part of a NATO force. And it's that kind of incident that makes people realize just how deep is this blood hatred. I, I think... I, okay, go ahead. Annie, please. I'll be brief. Uh, I, I agree that we should be mentioning cases like um, what, what occurred with Safarov and how Azerbaijan reacts to him as a hero, gave him a parade, etc. But also to really point out and understand that the, this special issue and especially the Lachin Quarter blockade this last uh, the, the nine months of this year uh, were really severely humanitarian crisis. And part of the reason that people began to perhaps be interested in it in August, not only the reports of it being a genocide, but also the first uh, case of death by starvation in the region. And we see the definition of genocide that we go to deliberately causing harm. Many women who, who suffered miscarriages and had lack of nutrition and the stress. So this is a very human impact. So is that people can conflate this conflict with the war, which is a very contentious because if you look at the history, there are questions about in, in, uh, territorial integrity and law, and that can get a little bit messy. But specifically this year in particular, what has happened and what the Gharafa population suffered, this is why people should care uh, on a human basis. So I can talk more, but I'll let Bedros, and I know we're gonna wrap up soon, so. Unfortunately, Mark, polit politics triumphs morality. Uh, Armenians try to use crosses, religion, churches. It doesn't work. Because at the end of the day, U.S. is interested in whatever it's interested in. And its national security is important. Its interests in the region are important. And, uh, uh, and it's, 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 it reflects as what uh, Samantha Power did, U.S. aid, director of US, administrator of US aid, went there and gave $11 million uh, as aid. So uh, raising awareness in the US is good, but as long as that awareness does not reflect in action by the US government, it's useless, if you ask me. It suggests that the, the arguments need to be made politically, that there needs to be a political argument made and I'm not sure if if the collective we have effectively made those arguments to this point. Henry. 
Um, I'll, I'll just add, um, I agree with you know, the points that have been made. Um, this is an incredible uphill battle. Um, however, it is very important that people not stop asserting um, the, the, the appropriate viewpoints. I agree with Bedros, although I will say that realpolitik is just another ethical viewpoint. Um, it's a viewpoint that, that holds that, that um, particular things are more valuable than human lives and democracy and things like that, but it is an ethical viewpoint. Um, but if, if Armenians and others, and this relates to other issues in the world as well, stop making the claims, uh, the ethical and other claims that need to be made, it actually makes it easier for those who are, who are operating against them to succeed. Um, at least making things morally uncomfortable, if not for the perpetrators themselves, then at least for bystanders, um, can have an effect. Um, and we also can't forget that um, politics can change dramatically. Um, and right now, I like to think that Azerbaijan is about the apex of its history. Um, maybe it will continue to, to trend upward. I don't know. I'm, ho I'm hoping that's not the case because I think that will be a disaster, even more of a disaster for Armenians. Um, but if things start to shift, then consistently asserting um, human rights arguments and, and the kind of concern that Ani uh, raised is crucial for making sure these issues actually have a role in, in future discussions. Um, so as hard as it is to make But I think there's Points. Obviously, oh, a I'm movie sorry. in it, certainly a documentary, uh, and the more uh, that media can concentrate on how democracy can just disappear when other major countries look the other way. Uh, it is a case of moral blindness by the world, and I think it could be told extremely well uh, on either by movie or particularly by documentary. Well, it, then it leaves me just to conclude and to say thank you to our panelists for your excellent presentations and, and moreover for the excellent work in the uh, journal issue itself, which, which people can read at greater length and, and at, at greater leisure. Uh, and of course, I want to thank the audience for being with us today and for who will be watching online subsequently. And uh, particularly want to thank the Gulbenkian Foundation for their support and our friends and colleagues at the Zorian Institute, especially Megan, for their support and collaboration uh, in, in planning and bringing off today's program. So thank you all. Thank you for your good work and uh, see, you, see you further up the road.